I am going to then try to locate biotechnology within the ph uh, pharmaceutical value chain of um, cannabis. And uh, uh, as introduced, I am co-director of the TUTCSR hub. And also we kind of come under the umbrella of uh, what we call Afghan partners. Maybe just a little bit about the, the chair that I um, host. So the Pharmaceutical and Biotech Advancement in Africa uh, chair has its focal areas, as, as you can see, the whole pharmaceutical value chain. So whether it's pharmaceutical, uh, we've done some work on the bio, biopharma side of things, particularly training. Um, and I think with ICGEB, actually, the Triester uh, group uh, on biosimilars, um, complementary medicine, which is, uh, in a sense, where cannabis falls in part of the time. Um, uh, there's also quite a bit of clinical research that we, 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 we do. At the moment, we have a project funded by the MRC where we are looking at clinical testing of um, a, a, a medicinal herbal product from you know one of our knowledge holders and then uh, quite a bit of work in pharmacovigilance so in that area i'm particularly interested in the standard of medicines uh, as you know we have quite a lot of substandards and in fact one of the problems we will talk about in the cannabis value chain is also um, fake and substandard products um and then really what we are looking at is regulatory strengthening, technology transfer and support, research and development, and also uh, businesses. How do we support businesses? Um, how do we get the startup culture going across the, the region? So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what the chair aims to do. So maybe let's talk about the business of the day which is cannabis and hemp and maybe a lot of you are familiar with this and I'll give you information that you probably know more um, than I do but it's also important that we take everyone along so in terms of um, cannabis and hemp the difference there is very minor but and we'll talk about it in general, we talk about three different species, right? So cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and, and ruderalis. And then there are a lot of varieties um, out of this uh, out of this very prolific uh, herb. Um, to the untrained eye, they all look the same. Uh, but you can see here that sativa has it's kind of more leaves around it, uh, smaller leaves than indica and then ruderalis. But um, I've seen varieties of cannabis which you would never think are, um, you know, cannabis species. Okay, so let's focus then on hemp and on marijuana. So in the U.S., they like to use this scary word marijuana, which comes from, um, you know, Mexico. And that really has to do with the history of prohibition around alcohol and around can um, cannabis. In South Africa and most of the world, we tend to talk about marijuana as being medical cannabis uh, or recreational cannabis. And then we talk about hemp on the one side as, as industrial hemp. Um, and as I've already uh, shown you that there are um, uh, slight differences, right? Um, from hemp, we get CBD oil. We also get hemp oil, hemp seed oil, which if you go into... Uh, supermarket pick and pay you'll probably be able to to get hemp seed oil um put it on your salads and they have no real effect uh because it's just like olive oil really and then um there's also this thing called um cannabis oil hemp typically has uh tetrahydrocannabinol thc below 0 0.3 percent and uh that is a point of controversy as i'll show you just now so the THC, for those that are uninitiated in this area, is a compound that makes you high, that has psychoactive um, uh, pot potency. Um, so in other words, if you take CBD or hemp oil, you will not get high. 
there are other effects, positive effects that you get out of that. And then um, in terms of medical cannabis, then uh, it, it would be THC oil. Sometimes it's called marijuana oil and would contain high levels of uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, the THC. Anything from 15% all the way up to 20, 25%. Uh, this this is really just in the flower. So the most important part of this uh, herb is the flower, but you can use um, other plant parts as well for various things. So let's look at the situation in Africa. So in Africa, we have just under 10 countries which have now legalized uh, cannabis in one form or another. The first country was uh, pioneering really was Lesotho. And they issued up to 149 licenses. Uh, I will, most of them are not yet operational. Okay, let me go back. Um, uh, for various reasons. Uh, in Lesotho, they also don't tend to distinguish between hemp and medical cannabis, as we do, for instance, in the rest of the region. Like in South Africa, we now have 99 medical cannabis licenses, and we have almost 400 um, hemp, industrial hemp licenses. Um, Zimbabwe distinguishes, so they have about 59 medical and uh, over, over 39. The most recent country to legalize is Ghana. In the past month, they've, they've legalized it. The other thing to note here is the fact that in hemp, there's a limit. And in South Africa, it's 0.2%. Which is a very difficult barrier, actually, because THC is really made by UV insulation. So the more UV you have, uh, and we have natural UV insulation in the region. So when you put out a hemp in into the sun, it then tends to elaborate this THC uh, to a higher degree than if you were growing it, say, in North America in um, uh the temperate region where the, 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 the their sun days are quite short. So so that is why um, most crop at the moment will not be able to meet this limit. And there's talk about moving this, I think, to 0.8%. Other countries in the region have moved it to 1%. Um, South Africa, again, is the only country at the moment in Africa which is looking at the recreational market it is already legal in the sense that um, you can grow three plants in your in your household uh, or up to six, right? Three plants per individual and up to six per household. Um, but you're not allowed to exchange that product for money because that becomes drug trafficking. Then when we look at the, the global market size, um, the cannabis industry is cooking. And you can see here that it's bound to uh, almost double from, if you look at the 2022, 2023 figures, and you look at 2026. So um, the um, growth there is phenomenal. It's a sunrise industry. And that's why we would like people, we would like to build it as an industry, particularly in Africa. Um, and you will see here on this side uh, how much it is going into each of these. So when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, you look at beauty um, and and social consumption, right? So pharmaceutical beauty, keep an eye on that because that is where biotech can play an important role in unlocking a value in this industry. When we look at the South African situation, you can see there the CAGR is uh, 28% between 2022 and 2026. Uh, this is pretty similar to what I just showed you on a global level. Uh, I can't think of any other industry that's growing at such an exponential rate. So the other thing is uh, in the last two SONAs, um, in South Africa, the President Ramaphosa talked about 130,000 jobs being created. If we are smart, we might be able to create more jobs 
than this. And that's, that is exactly why this talk is important and some of the ideas that I'm going to share here would be key to that. Okay, let's start with the value chain because one needs to understand the value chain to then understand what role, uh, what skills will play in particular parts. So we start with the starter material. So the starter material is usually seed or clones or tissue. Uh, and then we go into the growing phase. Um, so the licenses that I showed you are all of them um, for growing, right? They're actually called cultivation licenses. And so SAPRA separates out cultivation from manufacturing or extraction because in the cannabis value chain, extraction is, is considered manufacturing. There's only one country, uh, one company in South Africa at the moment which has both a cultivation license and an extraction license or a manufacturing license, All right? So what it does is it limits farmers uh, to a very low value product, which is a flower, which they can grow and then um, be able to sell. And part of what we are, um, what we've done is actually to plug that gap and be able to provide a service for them where we do contract manufacturing. And we'll talk about that. And then when it comes to use, um, therapeutic use and industrial use. So that's what we will confine ourselves to. Uh, to. We are not really, and we don't deal with um, recreational consumption. Right. So, so let's start then with the starter material and the role of technology, or in this case, biotechnology. Well, um, cloning is probably the way to go because it is cost effective as compared to seeds. Um, it also preserves um, phenotype and genetics. So I think if I have any biotech people here, they will be able to tell me all the different ways in which you know uh, cloning happens and, and how they actually can do it. So these are skills that we would like in this uh, value chain. At the moment, there's a major shortage of seeds, actually certified seeds um, in the country. And then we also have our own land races, which actually need to be preserved. And so, um, you know, uh, this technology of cloning is very important. What do you need? You need a good mother, you know, just like they say, if you need, even in humans, if you need good genes, they always come from the mother, right? So. Get a good mother, and in this case, what does it mean? Um, they have to be disease resistant, um, and you'll find that a lot of our land races are actually disease resistant because they have been um, naturalized in these environments for at least three hundred years. Uh, just to note that cannabis is not an indigenous African resource. Cannabis actually originally comes out of China, moves into India, then across into Africa. And then with um, the slave trade, goes into, into the Americas, right? Okay. There is sometimes a myth to say it is indigenous, um, not from that uh, origin story anyway. So then um, the mother should also have high yields. Because, you know, at the end of the day, a crop always has to have good yields. It's got to be sturdy, so physically, so that it stands up. Because you don't want plants that lie down. So it's got to be sturdy. The other thing is, um, because most of the cannabinoids are trapped in trichomes, on, then you also need a good mother, which is going to produce dense trichomes. And... In terms of a uh, cannabis clone to um, to root, you're looking at, at two weeks, so it's 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 pretty fast. Whereas when you look at uh, seed um, and that whole seedling process, it it it's it's at least um, uh, double this, and then there's a lot of variation that you have to deal with when you look at seeds. The, the other technology here, biotech um, skill is micropropagation or tissue culture. Uh, so a colleague of mine at Stellenbosch and I did a bit of this um, with Sutherlandia because we were trying to just do colors cultures 
that would not have chlorophyll. You know, so this is another way actually of um, applying biotechnology in the cannabis industry. So that, um, you know, there are people who believe that you can get much cleaner product without um, even, but in this case, because the cannabinoids are not in the roots, they are in the flower, you would still need to then um, grow this tissue all the way to flower to be able to to, to get the, the cannabinoids. Right. Um, and for the tissue, plant tissue culture people, they will know that there's either, um, there's either uh, nodal culture or meristem culture. Um, and nodal uh, stores plants more safely. It can also help to eliminate surface pathogens. So what's uh, happened in the industry, at least up here in Gauteng, is that powdery mildew went through a lot of these uh, factories. And um, so the, the product was not, was contaminated with this powdery mildew. Uh, so using nodal cultures, you can be able to avoid that. Meristem is good, but it's more complicated. So it's, it's going to take you a long time. Uh, however, it can be used to eliminate viral and, and other, uh, you know, system, systemic uh, infections. Yeah, but it really needs people who know what they are doing. So again, the biotech uh, students can look at this and see a, an opportunity here. Then let's go to the part about the growing uh, of, of cannabis and what technologies, how can biotech play a part there? Well, so because um, these products are going into the human food chain or they are going into uh, medicine, we try to avoid use of pesticides. We try to avoid contamination with heavy metals. And then, of course, uh, microbial contamination, aflatoxins, those kind of things. And the way to do this is increasingly using biofertilizers, biostimulants, biocontrols. And um, I can tell you that the cannabis industry, I think, is has really, really stimulated this whole sector, this whole area. If you go to any one farm, you're going to have an array of products um, you know, that they would use. And especially if they are selling the flower, because if you're selling the flower and you, you spray things, uh, you, you can see that these things cause physical damage to the flower and buyers will be turned off by them. So, um, uh, Dennis, I know that you have a particular interest in biocontrol, biostimulants. And, and previously, ICGEB had um, a webinar uh, on this. So this is now where we can apply it, you know, in the African cannabis industry. Um, what's the value of the biofertilizer market? It's huge, you know, $5.2 billion by 2029. Um, but a lot of these products, again, are not being made in Africa. So that is where we need um, the biotechnology people to be, uh, you know, getting products that are relevant. And there are quite a few papers if you look on online, uh, and I'm willing to share some of those papers uh, if anybody reaches out to me on how do you actually go about, uh, you know, researching or working on, on a biofertilizer uh, or a biostimulant, which is relevant for um, this, this market. Oh, yeah, here are the papers actually. Plant growth promoting rhizobia, um, um, you know, and, and this is quite recent, 2023. It's a good paper. And then biofertilizer and biocontrol agents for agriculture, how to identify um, the new potent microbial strains, right? Because, you know, these are the biological or biotech means of increasing uh, yields, making sure that um, uh, the you know the cannabis in the field is protected from pathogens, but without then exposing consumers to uh, toxic contaminants. Next, um, extraction and manufacture. Uh, not sure if there's a 
room here for biotech, but there's certainly room for other technologies. And this is um, a facility that uh, I run at the CSIR. This is the heart and soul of the TUT CSIR Cannabis Research Hub. Um, what we have there is we have um, a supercritical fluid extractor, otherwise known as a, a CO2 or carbon dioxide extractor, which we imported and commissioned in July last year. And this is actually the only one of its kind at the moment um, in the region of this size, because this is a commercial size facility. And you can see um, on your on the left hand side, this is actually the green gold. So when you put in the, the flower and you put in the flowers in here, you push in um, chilled carbon dioxide, and then you're going to get this yellow gold. So this gold, this yellow gold is called um, full spectrum oil. And depending on whether it's from hemp or it's from medical cannabis, high THC, let's call it that, it will have a slightly different color. Um, and you can already use it as is because out of this machine, we get food grade extract. Or the other thing is then to go further and to isolate it into the different cannabinoids and, and also into THC. Um, so I've shown you the products. So how do we then move those products, that oil, into therapeutic and wellness um, uh, products and what they could be the potential role for uh, biotechnology. The first thing you need to do is to understand the world of cannabinoids because it's it's huge. You know, I think you're talking about uh, up to a hundred cannabinoids, and then over and above that, you've got you know terpenoids, uh, you've got flavonoids. Uh, and all manner of other secondary metabolites, right? Um, but at the center of it, what they call the grandmother uh, chemical is really um, CBGA, because you can see there that it, it it's the one out of that, it then gives all of these uh, compounds. And the ones that most people talk about is CBD, which is what's on the market. And then you can see here THC, right? But all of them would not really be there without these grandmother compounds. And um, so one can actually manipulate uh, metabolism here, right? So that you're able to increase the yields of certain of these uh, metabolites or reduce certain of those. So, so there's a lot of work around how is it that you can reduce uh, THC in, in hemp products, you know, and how is it that you can maybe get um, like things like CBG, for instance, are increasingly becoming um, important um, canna cannabinoids. So um, from a use perspective, a ph pharmacological um, actions, right, you can see here uh, why things like CBG, these are called the minor cannabinoids, are important. You know, they are good as antiproliferative agents, uh, bone stimulants, right? So you can already start to see an application like in osteoporosis or in postmenopausal women because bone stimulation is is a big thing at those at that age uh CBC you know anti-inflammatory uh, we know quite a bit about that anti-proliferative tends to come up quite a bit uh, across the whole range mm -hmm. then when we look at CBD you know um it has a whole range of potential uses um and this is really based on the endocannabinoid system Right, so they are um, a recept. There's a receptor system, just as you get with uh, morphine, you know, um, endorphin receptor system. You also tend to get a an endocannabinoid receptor system. So we actually have natural or endocannabinoids in 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 our body, 
and they have a fairly similar structure to this uh, exo exogen exogenous uh, yeah, exogenous uh, cannabinoids that are coming from these plants, right? So you'll see here there's a CB1, right, which is um, one of the endocannabinoids, and then there's CB2. Okay, and even anatomically, uh, the CB1s tend to be outside of the central nervous system. So you'll find that CBD generally tends to work outside of the uh, central nervous system. Um, whereas uh, then you have CB2s, uh, which tend to be more, um, I think, actually, sorry, it's the other way around. So CB1 is, is more central, and then CB2 uh, tends to be more uh, peripheral. Okay, uh, let's look at clinical trials. There are lots of clinical trials going on. Uh, 91 clinical trials. Um, if if you go to cleantrials.gov, all manner of uh, clinical trials, maybe some that are of importance, uh, pain management. You know, it's usually always pain, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, uh, neuropathy, right? And actually... When you look at those that have been conclusive, you will find that um, things like spastic uh, in stopping that in multiple sclerosis, uh, epilepsy, we already have a drug, yeah, uh, epiodolex. So there are people who say, no, nah, nothing is ever going to come out of CBD. But actually, um, epiodolex uses uh, CBD as its core structure or pharmacophore. And you can see here clinical trials and regulatory approval for these things already. Um, uh, chronic pain, schizophrenia, right? Uh, just to say that what they say is that using cannabis in, in a growing or young brain is not a very good idea because it, it unmasks, not causes, it unmasks schizophrenia, all right? So, that's why, in general, you don't want to be using uh, cannabis in those areas uh, of, you know, young young children. Um, then there are also all these other. So when we look at the clinical um, um, uh, clinical use, actually, what we find there is that, um, say, New Mexico has a medical cannabis access program. Uh, which started in 2016. So everybody who uses this, um, um, who uses cannabis has to have a card, right? And you can see that the most popular use of cannabis in, is in post-traumatic stress. So over 12,000 there. And then also in, in cancer, you have a, a relatively huge number and chronic severe pain. Right. So this is really good anecdotal evidence to show um, uh, the effects of cannabis and cannabis based medicines. Um, what what we've done from the university side is that we actually have a product that's called Nicello. Um, you can you can look it up. Sorry. Yeah, you can look it up. Um, it's a sorghum based a drink with probiotics in it so there's a little bit of you know biotechnology there but what we've also done is we've now come up with um it in small format and uh we use some of the spent hemp here in this product and and so people can can use it almost a, as a shot you know you just take it in in a small dose and you get uh, relatively um good effects um when you look at the South African landscape at the moment, the only thing that you will find is uh, CBD products. Unfortunately, these CBD products don't actually work because for CBD to work, you're looking at 200 milligram doses, 600, 1,200, so fairly high doses. But um, what you find on the market as a result of what SAPRA calls exemption notice is the fact that uh, is the fact that these products are uh, at 20 milligrams per meal, you know, and the, uh, the complete unit, they're supposed to be 600 milligrams. And so it's 
at far, far lower uh, um, sub-therapeutic doses than it should be. And unfortunately, this is also damaging the market because, you know, people use the product and they, they don't get an effect from it. And then they'll say, ah, you know, CBD doesn't work. Um, so I think that's a regulatory misstep uh, because we do need products that work. Uh, these are medicines and we need to create access to good medicines. Right. Let's look then at industrial applications and a little bit of the biotech there. Um, so this takes us to industrial hemp. And industrial hemp has a long history of use. Uh, in fact, the first fabric that became commercially available uh, globally was made from hemp. So this was before uh, cotton came um, in. And you will re remember that cotton uh, became commercially viable only because of the use of free labor of enslaved Africans, right? Um, otherwise, cotton is problematic, right? Uh, it's not good for, for the soil. We have to use a lot of uh, pesticides, a lot of fertilizers, and it also just generally degrades the soil. Um, whereas hemp is different, you know, hemp actually enhances uh, soil health. But the other interesting thing about hemp is that it recovers a lot of carbon dioxide, which I'll talk about a little bit later. What I wanted to focus on here is that um, you can use it. I think we talked about the oil, the different oils that you can use. Um, and personal, you know, the cosmetic uh, uh, products that you can develop, medicine that you can develop from that yellow substance that I showed you. Right. However, from the other plant parts, right, the stem, uh, maybe even the leaves, anything that is high in uh, lignocellulose, you can actually make bioplastics. And that's something that's becoming increasingly important because these bioplastics um you know, decomposing the environment after a little while. They are also very light. So when you look at the uh, electron electric vehicle market, um, the 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 inside of those vehicles is usually fiberglass substitutes made from hemp. Um, how do you make bio bioplastics? Well, it's again biotechnology. So you take uh, feedstock, which is rich in um, you know, uh, carbohydrate or lignocellulose, organic waste, and you put it into a biorefinery where you're using enzymes. And what you end up with is, you know, various bioplastics. This is a project that we are actually now going to embark on with some colleagues um, in the CSIR. What's the value? Because uh, it's important that we always focus on the value because it's an industry. Right, and you will see there that this industry um, will grow was ten point seven billion dollars U.S. dollars in twenty twenty one, and is projected to almost triple, right, over the next five years. So again, you can see that um, if we started getting into into this industry, utilize um, the biotechnology. Um, knowledge that we have, we would definitely be able to get more products out of this industry. Uh, carbon capture, at great expense, the Brits have come up with a great idea to capture carbon and put it underground. Uh, and this is tongue in cheek, because once you put it underground, then what happens? You know, is is it going to, to leak back into the atmosphere or whatever? And that's really because they want to continue to to exploit their petrochemical resources in the North Sea, right? But what we know is that hemp is very good at uh, uh, absorbing carbon dioxide. So the calculation is that... Um, one hectare of hemp absorbs between eight and 12 tons of carbon dioxide over that um, 
three month period that you are growing it at. And the beauty about this is you get carbon dioxide, right? And then the hemp is, is, is um, the carbon dioxide, well, you get oxygen, right? Back into the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide is trapped um, pretty much, you know, for, for eternity because then you can use this biomass to, to build uh, structures. We didn't really talk about hempcrete, but hempcrete is one of those things that that's, that's also on, on the map, you know, uh, on the roadmap. Um, you can use this for bioplastics, right? So definitely a smarter way of doing things. Uh, of course, I mean, I don't think hemp grows that much in the UK, uh, but it, this would be a much cheaper way of us doing it. And and so that's one of the things that we should be focusing on in Southern Africa. Um, in South Africa, we have the National Cannabis Master Plan. And this is really where all the things I've talked about are coming from and also how we are supporting this master plan. So when you look at education and training, it is a, a base for this master plan. And this is really where we are. And then also look at um, research and development aspects. Um, other things I, I have probably touched on. So whatever it is that you we are doing in this should really feed into this um, master plan. And uh, sooner or later, there will be a regional master plan, which is like a static wide master plan so that we are all coordinated into this original value chain for cannabis. Um, the master plan identifies various stakeholders at different parts of the value chain. Uh, so you will see here universities, CSIR, uh, but as I've shown you that actually biotech plays a role across the entire value chain. So it's important that we start funding uh, relevant research relevant uh, product development, relevant um, technology dissemination into this uh, value chain. Okay, so then let's talk about the challenges. Well, legislative restriction is definitely one of those challenges. Um, initially in South Africa, it started with a big push around a recreational use, you know, the Prince ruling was really about recreational and religious cultural uses, right? And then suddenly um, the regulators were caught off guard and then they had to almost paddle back. So initially hemp was then lumped together with uh, medical cannabis and given over to Sapra. And then after that, a new regime had to come through, which then set, set took, took out hemp into the uh, Department of Agriculture. Whereas when you look at the Malawi situation, for instance, they have one clearing house. So everything is under the, the cannabis development uh, agency, right? In a sense, it streamlines all the processes. There's also a lack of uh, good understanding of cannabis and cannabis industry beyond these myths that, you know, this is a dangerous thing, it's going to make you high. That's the only thing that it does to make you high. But I'm hoping that I have illustrated the fact that this is actually uh, an industry that is le legitimate and can create a lot of value uh, for our countries in the region. As a result of legislative restrictions, we see a proliferation of fake, illegal, or substandard cannabis-based medicines. And I've kind of partly illustrated the reason why um, that has happened. If you, I mean, if you're any, on any of these uh, WhatsApp groups, you see people are selling uh, things there that are very difficult to authenticate. Uh, to, um, whether, you know, the safety aspects, are they there? Um, what about contaminants, right? Because we know that in South Africa, we are a mining country. So so growing a, a lot of these things in the soil uh, means that you might end up with a lot of heavy metal contamination in product. One of the other problems is a lack of access of testing facilities 
or adequate testing facilities in the country. So, you know, there's that opportunity. Um, high entry barriers, certainly on the medical cannabis, you need about 22,000 rand to get a SAPRA license. But once you've paid that, which is affordable, you can say, you then need an upfront, upfront investment of anything between 15 and 100 million rand. You know, so I've been to facilities that have been extremely uh, conservative and built built themselves up uh, on on 15 million rand, which is no pocket change. And I've been to facilities which are like a hundred million rand, right? Um, the other thing is uh, certified uh, seed supply. Uh, so we're still quite early in the cycle, and there's a fairly huge shortage of certified seed, but that presents an opportunity particularly for um, land races. Uh, then mainstreaming marginalized rural farmers. This is something that the president has talked about, but really uh, my argument is, can you really mainstream uh, rural farmers into a pharmaceutical value chain if you're looking at the medical aspects of things? Not easy. Um, then the cost of technology, I think we've tried to address that. Lack of research and development is also another issue. But I'm hoping that after today, we will start to, to think differently. Okay, uh, we have a channel, so you can follow us on this uh, YouTube channel, uh, where we, we, we talk a lot about all sorts of things around the biotech uh, space, uh, you know, herb and cannabis, uh, I think vaccines in Africa, that was a collaboration with ICGEB in Cape Town. Um, and then we also have a newsletter. So you can drop uh, an email to Nano here if you want to get our newsletter. It's not specifically on, on cannabis and hemp. It's really on uh, medicinal plants in, in the region uh, and across Africa and standards that are, you know, that are important for that. This particular one was a cannabis and hemp uh, special issue where we actually went to to Lesotho and we witnessed the, the official launch of a 100 million rand facility. We were also with them, the then Minister of, of Health in Lesotho. Okay, with that, I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on uh, this, these emails. Thank you.